So we're going to go on and talk about technique now. And we'll start, of course, with filling the, filling the bladder. And in terms of your reading for doing urodynamics, then, of course, the terminology is important. And as Andrew Gary said in the film, the good urodynamic practice is, in fact, uh, there is, in fact, now a 2016 update of that. So um, that's it. Basically, the messages are the same. And then also, as um, Professor Shimon said, there is the UKCS document about quality standards. And you can get that so if you subscribe to Neurourology and Urodynamics. So if we define filling systometry, then we're measuring, during filling, we're measuring pressure and volume on a continuous basis. Therefore, we need to know what the pressure is, and we need to know how quickly we're filling the bladder in order to calculate the bladder volume at any point. And so the measurements that we need to measure, everybody needs to measure in basic urodynamics, is the abdominal pressure, which most people would measure by a rectal catheter. Now, if you are only seeing women, then it would be perfectly acceptable to do it by a vaginal catheter. But we're urologists, so we tend to see both men and women, and it's easier just to have one technique. So we, we measure, certainly in our department, we measure rectal pressure. The only time we don't measure it there is if somebody has a stoma. So if somebody's had an anterior perineal resection, then we measure down the stoma, the abdominal pressure. Uh, bladder pressure, and then detrusor pressure, of course, is the bladder pressure minus the rectal pressure, and flow rate, and bladder volume. So uh, here's our poor patient sitting here. Um, as I said earlier on, in theory, we probably should warm the bladder, warm the fluid to body temperature, but providing it's over 20. It doesn't matter. Uh, and then with uh, a catheter measuring rectal pressure, a catheter measuring bladder pressure, and then the electronics producing the subtracted truth pressure. Then the patient here is sitting over the flow, rep, flow meter, which measures uh, the urine flow and the volume voided. And of course, the pump, if we know how quickly the pump is pumping, then we know what the bladder volume is. So if we look at measurement of pressure, which I think you should have a good feel for now, particularly having seen the video, it's really measuring a height of pressure. And because it started with simple measures like this, so this is my predecessor in Bristol um, doing systometry in the 1960s. He got interested in studying the pressures in patients with urinary retention. So he connected the patient's catheter up to a central venous pressure line, and then he filled through the side. So he filled for 50 mLs, measured the pressure, filled for 50 mLs, measured the pressure, and then he drew the filling system. He had no, he had no measuring equipment other than measuring the height from here to the patient's bladder which is, of course, the intracycle pressure. That's why it's measured in centimeters of water. So there are a couple of things we need to talk about in terms of pressure. So if this is a bladder, which is eight centimeters high, then the point at which we define zero in relation to the bladder is important. If we measure the pressure from here, then the bladder pressure is that height from there to the top of the fluid column, which in this case is 28 centimeters of water. If we measure from the top of the bladder, then it's less, 20 centimeters. So you can see immediately you've got a problem. So you have to standardize. And the standardization, of course, that is agreed is the superior edge of the synthesis pubis. So that's how we stand and that's the reference height for pressure as was said in the video. And that's perfectly acceptable unless you want to do your, well here you might want to do it on the top of the Himalayas. And that would make a difference. 
you did your academics on the top of the Himalayas, but really not apart from that. So for practical purposes, this system works uh, worldwide. So the transducers, as you know, are filled with liquid, uh, not fluid, liquid, and that applies to both the line in the bladder and the line in the rectum. And usually the transducers are on a stand next to the patient. And of course we use transducers, and this is quite an old-fashioned one, but it shows um, very nicely what we need. The most important bit of the transducer, as you're aware, is this diaphragm. So here, oops, sorry. So here we've got the electronic part of the di of the transducer and the the dome, which connects the patient, which is filled full of uh, liquid that has been removed. And here is the diaphragm. So how does a transducer work? Where's the? Would you like to tell us how a transducer works? You've got the microphone. Uh, and the fluctuation of pressure. Uh, the water column. So the water column produces uh, the changes in pressure. This is the the changes in pressure. Transducer measures the changes in pressure. So a, tra a transducer, by definition, takes a signal and changes it into a different sort of signal. Yeah. So in these transducers, what's the original signal? It's the uh, pressure of the water. The, it's a pressure. Uh, I, I, I yeah. The, uh, uh, yeah, hydrostatic pressure. It's a wave. And what's the, what do you transduce it into? It's a, it's a, uh, not in, it's a, uh, in a graphical signal. Well, then you transduce it into an electrical signal. electrical signal. And so how is that done? Do you know how that is done? Yeah, that Anybody know? Amplify the... We've got to do something before that. But why, how can we transduce? How can we change a pressure wave into an electrical signal? Change, change of capacitance. Hmm? Change of capacitance. So what, what is happening is, as the wave, so here in the resting state, there's no pressure change. So you have a flat line. Then you have a small wave. It hits the diaphragm. And that gives us a small change. Here's a bigger wave. It hits the diaphragm, and you get a bigger change. Well, you can see that what is happening is the wave is distorting the, the diaphragm. So, does anybody know what this thing on the back here is called? A strain gauge. Okay. And these are these are magical pieces of metal. I say magical in the same sense that, to me, magnets are magical. I don't understand really how a magnet works, and I don't really understand how this works. But if you put an electrical current across this piece of metal, when the metal is deformed, its resistance increases. And therefore, you have a difference in output from the strain gauge. That is, transdu that is the transduction from a hydrostatic signal into a change in resistance which then is interpreted as a pressure by the machine. So very fancy, but um, they will have studied the pressure changes in the 737 Maxi that crash. And they, the pressure transducers will measure the same pressures, same principles, very different pressures, of course. So that's the principle of transduction and the way that we measure pressure. So we've talked about the reference transducer height. So the external transducers, you place them at the upper border of the synthesis pubis. And if we all do that, we all can talk to each other. If we all did it a different way, all the pressures would be different. We wouldn't have any idea about what, what was detrusor underactivity, what was detrusor overactivity, etc. Now the second pressure that we need is the reference pressure. And as you know, that is that you must zero to atmospheric pressure, not to the bladder or rectal pressure. Is that what you do in India? Yeah. yeah. Well, you'd be amazed that Andrew Gammy and I uh, are just finishing a multi-center, multi-continental urodynamic audit. 
And it's extraordinary what people do around the world. And even when we've told them that the correct way of measuring pressure, the physiological way of measuring pressure, is to set to atmosphere, they persist to set it to the patient, so they start off at zero. So if you think about that, that's really very illogical. So let's just go through this again. Here you can see the syringe for flushing through. Here's the transducer. And here is the three-way tap. So we're setting to zero now. Is this the right way or the wrong way? Who votes for the right way of setting to zero? Who votes for the wrong way? Okay, who abstained? <laughs> well, some of you are not telling the truth. Some people abstained. Never mind. Most of you said that that was correct. And you're right. That is correct because obviously here the transducer is shut off to the syringe, so that's good. The transducer is shut off to the catheter, which is good. So the only connection between the transducer and anywhere else is to the air here. What about this one? Is this okay or not okay? Who votes for okay? Who votes for not okay? You're correct. So again, this is exactly the same as this, except we happen to have put the patient's catheter into the bladder, which is fine because it's still closed off by the three-way tap here. So the only connection is between the transducer and atmosphere. So we're setting to atmosphere. How about at the bottom here? Is that OK? Not OK. Good. Excellent. So that's in contact with the patient, and setting zero there will be wrong. So this is something from the UKS, UKCS minimum standards for urodynamics, okay, that uh, Professor Sinner was talking about. And uh, we can't go through it all. It's a very lengthy document. But one of the questions on quality control are bladder pressure and rectal pressure zero to atmosphere after zeroing and then connected to the patient. So that's very clear. So what do you think about this trace? Where are we? I've forgotten. <coughs> Standing in your way. Tell us what you think about this trace. So this is empty. The patient started. Well, actually, I said, that's not true. It's not empty. There's already 75 mLs in the bladder, but you can still work out what's going on. So what are the pressure readings at the moment? Sorry, what are the pressures at the moment? Well, if we look at it, the, the pressures are zero, zero, and zero. Okay, so this has been zero in the patient. The normal pressures are much higher than that. Well, not much higher than that, but at least 10 centimeters of water, minimum higher than that. And then you can see that the patient is being filled 75 up to 95. And then there's a peak here in the bladder pressure. And they've signaled that that is a detrusive contraction with that line. OK, now abdominal pressure yes. is going along. You're seeing a similar pressure there on detrusive pressure, so that might be correct. But what we haven't got so far is any quality. We don't know whether this is good quality. So, Whenever you do your aerodynamics, you've got to assess, assess the quality at the beginning. So now they've decided to ask the patient to do some coughs. Would you expect the pressure when somebody coughs to be the same in the bladder as in the rectum? Yes. Yes. Yes or no? Yes. 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 yes, absolutely right. So here we've got four coughs in the rectum. 
nothing there. So when, the, when you have that, you have no statement of quality. So you cannot interpret the trace. So they've done, they've started off wrong, and they've got poor quality, and they've done nothing about it here. So what you would expect them to do here is at least to think about the bladder trace. Why are there no coughs on the bladder trace? So this is a useless investigation. This has wasted the patient's time. And worse, they may make a wrong diagnosis because of that. Next person. Tell us what you think about this one. So again, it's, it's bladder here, rectum here, and then detrusor pressure in red. So, at this beginning, all are near zero. So now we are at now we are at zero volume. Okay, yeah. so this is really at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, as time progresses, that uh, P abdomen goes to the negative and P dead goes to the positive side. So have they zeroed in the patient or have they zeroed to atmosphere? They have zeroed the patient. At the patient. In the patient, correct. So that's zero, zero, zero. Now, why do people do this? Because quite clearly, physiological measurement is about measuring the real pressure. And I think, I think somebody has told me in the past, they do it because it looks nice. <laughs> it's all very easy, because everything starts at zero. So every change from zero is what we want to know. Detrusor pressure, but you can see here, it hasn't worked out. Why has it not worked out in this case? How did the catheter have come out? What abnormality do you see occurring as the bladder is filled? The abdominal pressure is in the negative side. Right. So the abdominal pressure is falling. Is there any reason why, when you fill the bladder, the abdominal pressure should go down? The rect we're talking about rectal pressure. Remember? Yes. We should. I think maybe we should call it rectal pressure. But the reason we measure the pressure there is for an approximation of abdominal pressure. But it is actually rectal pressure. So you have to think a little bit about whether this whether this fall could be something to do with the rectum. Maybe it's even in other words, if you put the, in other words, if you put the catheter into the vagina, would the same thing have happened? Well, we don't know. But is there any reason that you know of that rectal pressure would go down during bladder filling? Maybe the, the rectum gets emptied at the flatus. It's clear. Um, sorry. Uh, maybe the rectum gets clear during the bladder filling. He might have passed the flatus at the time. Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's possible. We, we should do a study. Well, you, you do a study in the quarter. So it, it would be quite easy. You could just inject, you could inject 50 mLs of air into the rectum, couldn't you? <coughs> Through a tube, do a measurement, and then let the air out <laughs> without the patient doing it because that's in bad taste. Um, you can suck the air out and then see if there's a difference. It, maybe there is. But I've never thought of that and I've never noticed patients making funny noises <laughs> during, during the aerodynamics. So, well, I, actually, I think the answer is no. I don't know any reason why the pressure would go. Any other problem with this trace? So you can see, as you rightly say, you end up with a negative pressure in the rectum. <coughs> so that's not really likely to happen, is it? You're not likely to have a negative pressure in your rectum. With the rectal balloon, I've got... Sorry, the balloon. The, the, the tube, the, we may use the glove inside the rectal... Oh, well, we'll come to that. We don't, we should, you shouldn't have a balloon on the end of your cast. No, not a balloon. Not, yeah. It's not, not a balloon. Use that. Not a, and what's the other obvious problem here? The cycle and the abdominal pressure, pressure are not... The rectal catheter isn't measuring the pressure properly. The transmission of both the pressures are not equal. So these are, these are coughs. And the cough height is that in the bladder and only that in the rectum. And they're supposed to be the same height. So those two pieces of information, a falling pressure and a poor cough response, suggests there's a problem with the rectal catheter, some problem or other, and they haven't done anything about it. So again, this is a useless trace. And these are traces that came through in this study. So this is important. This was a, 
this was assessing a treatment and the quality of the urine which is useless. So this is not unusual and as uh, Dr. Siller said, there's, there's no regulation of quality about urodynamics, which of course is quite different from some of the other physiological measurements. So, so that's something that professional organizations like ours and, and Eurocide probably need to deal with. How about this one? <coughs> quality. So whenever you look at a urodynamic trace, think about quality. So make a judgment about quality. Is it good, medium, or bad? Who votes for good here? One vote for good. Who votes for bad? Lots of you. Who votes for medium? Um, is that a political statement? Middle of the road? Not left wing, not right wing? <laughs> No, maybe not. Okay, so more people said it was bad than good. Well, okay, let's look at the evidence. We've talked about coughs. Coughs, coughs, equal, therefore, to true pressure, they're subtracted out. So in that sense, those that said this was bad quality are unlikely to be correct. All right? What else has happened? There's some other bits and pieces here. And this is your favorite. It's due to... <laughs> maybe talking a bit of movement so that's good because it actually tells us that when you talk or you move you would expect the pressure to be the same in the bladder as in the rectum so these are the same and they subtract out completely so I would say this is very high quality but there is an interesting artifact on here what is it? starting zero, zero level the pressures are higher, higher in the abdomen as well as the so what was was it zero correctly in the patient? Or was, I'm sorry, was it zero correctly to atmosphere or was it zero in the patient? It's not zero in the patient, sir. If it's zeroed in the patient, it's zero, zero, zero. It's not zero, 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 is it? It's about 35 here and about 35 here. It's zero for detrusor because when you subtract that from that, it's about zero. So this is fine. It's zero to atmosphere. That's good. What other artifact can anyone see? Negative is there to void there's a negative There's no this is just a filling trace. This is going from zero volume to 191, 260. With no voiding of this. Well, what about what's all this? What's this here? Tubes are uh, at, like uh, having connection with the filling tube, so it's uh, showing the zigzag pattern because of movement of the water. Because something's hitting it. You mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, if it if it is, then it's hitting both tubes, isn't it? Which is actually quite difficult to do. So this could be something <coughs> as simple as breathing. So next time you do urodynamics, ask your patient to take five deep breaths, and you will see five waves. People don't think about it, but it is something that you see. So that's a physiological artifact. It's not a bad artifact, it's, it's physiological. So this is a good quality trace. So this is how it should look at the billing, uh, beginning of filling systometry. So if we think about abdominal pressure a bit more, as I've said, it's measured in the rectum or the vagina, and the changes in abdominal pressure could be due to breathing, talking, laughing, straining all sorts of things. So assessing quality, there are three ways you can do assessing quality. And these show all three ways. Can you just quickly tell us what, we've talked about two of the ways, what's the third one? Zero and the cough uh, has been checked. The coughs, right? The coughs here. Um, it was a pressure. Uh, yep, the coughs pressure. are pretty much the same, but there are still spikes here. Why is that? Anyone know what that's due to? Uh, 
delayed transmission. So if these are the two transducers, right? If these are the two, de de the two transducers, and here are the waves coming from the patient. What is happening here, if you look, the initial is down, right? The initial is down, and then there's an equal size up. So what, if this is the bladder transducer, and this is the rectal transducer, what's happened here is the waves have come along like that, and the rectal wave has hit the transducer slightly before. And we're talking about much less than a second. It hits it first, so you have a negative wave. If the bladder had hit first, you would have had a positive wave. So the rectum has hit first, and then the bladder hits. So the bladder wave lasts a little bit longer, and therefore you have a positive spike, which follows a negative. So that's okay. It doesn't matter. We're not going. But if you don't like that, then the other way. So the fine detail here, like the bit of talking or whatever. That's perfectly subtracted out, isn't it? And the third way, which in a way is more logical, is to ask the patient to strain. So these are valsalva movements here. Interestingly here, the patient is bleak, you see. This is the flow curve. So on these big coughs, the patient has leaked. They haven't leaked with valsalva. And here's another valsalva. So when you do valsalvas, this isn't done for quality in this case, but it's done to try and make the patient leak. When you do valsalvas, you start, and then you get the patient to strain more and more and more. So here, again, that's the second valsalva, but there's no leakage. And a valsalva is much more like a bladder contraction in terms of the speed of change. Now, of course, <coughs> are so fast that there's nothing the bladder can do as quickly as that. So coughs are good for showing stress incontinence, but they're not probably the best way to assess quality. So here it's worked fine, but if you have a problem with the coughs and you think, well, I'm sure, I, I'm sure everything's okay, just get the patient to strain instead. This is a very slow change, a bit more like a detrusor contraction, much more relevant in a way. And if that's okay, then you're, you're all right to continue. So you've got those three ways of assessing quality. So Wait, that is not concerned that cough induced in it is correct. Um, no, I don't think there's any cough induced intrusion of activity here. Yeah, that the abdomen uh, is contracting. Uh, and immediately next uh, corresponding to that, there is a that is a peak, is it? Yes. Are you talking here? Yeah, exactly, yes. There's no change in underlying pressure. So there's no contraction. If that was to choose if that was cough induced trigger activity, you'd see a rise in pressure like that. And here again is breathing. Okay, the patient is breathing here. This is the only thing that gives you this rhythmic waveform like that. So what's happening then next? What do you, how can you explain what's happened here? We're saying the quality is good because if you look at the breathing here and some movement maybe talking here, it's subtracted out completely. Again, here there's a bit of something different here, it's subtracted out. So the quality is good. Some change in position of the patient. Good. Okay. So when you lie down, the pressure is at its lowest. When you sit, the pressure is higher, and when you stand, it's a little bit higher. So here, the patient may, well, the patient certainly has changed position. The other reason could, could be that the, the investigator changed the position of the transducers. Or the patient moved, and they didn't change the position of the transducers. But whatever it is, it applies to both. And you're, you're going to be right. It's going to be due to change in the position of the patient. Good. Next, gentlemen. So first of all, tell me, each time, tell me whether this is good quality. So here we've got filling. Here we've got red for rectum, blue for bladder, green for detrusor. 
good quality trees. Good? Good quality trees. Good quality, okay, yeah. Coughs here are pretty similar. A little tiny positive one, but that's okay. So I agree with you, the quality. Up here, the quality again, there's a big cough there, that's fine. What do you see? Well, there's a couple of things you can see, aren't there? Uh, the contractions. Yeah, good. So there's repeated small, they, these are small contractions, they're not particularly high, they've been signaled as D, detrusive. So those are detrusive contractions, yeah. And because it's good quality, even though this, you see that zero to 100, always remember to look at the scaling. So these changes of pressure here are only about five centimeters of water, and they may not be significant if the patient doesn't have symptoms. Um, but because it's good quality, you can say that those are small detrusive contractions. What happens here? So I think what's happened here is the patient has been stood up and then they've been asked to cough, probably to try and demonstrate stress incontinence. And then the woman's been sat down again and the pressure again stabilizes. Uh, there's a small contraction there, it would appear. Well, let's just analyze that. If we say there's a contraction there, then we should be able to see one there and we can't. So that's probably due to this fall in rectal pressure at that point. So remember, just because you see an increase in detrusive pressure doesn't mean it's a detrusive contraction. If you get a fall in rectal pressure, that will give you an increase in detrusive pressure. That's an artifact, doesn't mean anything. So in order to say, well, yes, that's meaningful, we would have to see a rise there, which we don't see. And as it's high quality, we would. So that's an, that's an artifact of the test. So bladder pressure, we of course want to measure. And bladder pressure is the pressure in the bladder. And the changes are similar, of course, to the changes in rectal pressure. Any cause of increased abdominal pressure will raise the bladder pressure. But of course, in addition, we've got the possibility of detrusive contraction and the possibility of reduced low bladder compliance. So you saw this trace earlier, didn't you? So blue for bladder, um, red for rectum, and green for detrusion. Yep, this, yes, well, not quite zero, it's a little bit more, isn't it? It's about five or ten. Approaching ten, that mark is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So, but that's okay. While so, raising the, the cycle pressure, abdominal pressure is raised, and there are detrusive contractions as well. Yeah, so there are repeated detrusive contractions. There's no change in rectal pressure. It's a good quality trace. The cough is well subtracted. So that is detrusor overactivity. So detrusor pressure, as I've said, as you all know, is bladder pressure minus rectal pressure. Remember, detrusor pressure does not exist. You can't put a catheter in and measure detrusor pressure. It's electronically derived. So you have to remember that. And that's why I keep saying Go and look at the rectal pressure, go and look at the bladder pressure. If they're not working properly, detrusive pressure means nothing. And we only do it for our convenience. And it's a mistake to rely on detrusive pressure because there are artifacts which you can work out from looking at rectal and bladder pressure. So if you have increased detrusive pressure, of course it may be due to a detrusive contraction, it may be due to reduced bladder compliance. But reduced detrusive pressure may be due to a rectal contraction. So you have to think about that. 
Now, it's easy to deal with if you go back and look at the raw data, go back and look at the bladder pressure and the rectal pressure. So, tell us what you think about this one, this trace. So, usual red for rectum, blue for bladder, green for detrusor. Good quality. Good quality, yep. Yeah, Nice cough equal there, a bit of fine detail, contract, um, subtracted out. So what's this? What's all this stuff here? Andrew showed that in his film, didn't he? Somebody's moving the patient or the patient's shifting around, fidgeting. So what, what do you see after that? There's a corresponding rise in the bead that has an intrusive contraction also. Um, here, bead that's bead that. Sorry? Forward by negative uh, traces of the bead that. The negative traces of the bead Negative, so there are dips here, you mean here? Okay, so why is that? That fidgeting caused the catheter to Whether the catheter has slipped the rectal tube? Uh, well, that's not very likely because look, there's something happened here. It looks like a cough, but that's okay. But it doesn't look like there's any problem with quality. So why? Well, as I say, if you have a problem and this doesn't make sense, look at the other data. Look at bladder pressure, look at rectal pressure. What does that tell you? Bladder pressure. What about bladder pressure in blue? Anything going on? Nothing. Well, there's a little bit here, isn't there? There's a wave there, but there's also a wave there. So that gets, that should cancel off. And they cancel out, so that's a change in abdominal pressure. Maybe a small valve salve or something. Okay, what about the rectal pressure? Anything happening there? Uh, they could represent rectal contractions as it said before. Or Sorry? Rectal contractions as it said Yes, yeah, good. Okay, so there's repeated waves here. And these look like, if that was the bladder line, you'd say they were small detrusive contractions, wouldn't you? Well, these are rectal contractions. So when the bladder contracts, you don't expect to see a change in the rectal pressure. When the rectum contracts, you don't expect to see the change in the bladder pressure. So here we've got repeated rectal contractions, no change in the bladder pressure. When you subtract these rectal pressures from the bladder pressure, you get all these dips. So if you were just relying on the detrusor pressure, you might say, oh, this is detrusor overactivity. But of course, if it was detrusor overactivity, you would check on the bladder line and there's nothing. So these are rectal contractions, and you need to be aware of them because we see them on a, re on a regular basis, particularly in neurological patients. Just for the next year. Quality? Quality is good quality. Yeah, you've got one cough at the end, haven't you, and that's fine, yeah. on the detrusive pressure line then? It's the same thing. It is, looks like the same as previous one. Which one? Negative, uh, negative dips are there in the... So there, are, there are falls in pressure. Fall in pressure in the bead yeah. area. During increase in the abdominal... Uh, bead area, bead abdominal. With increases in pressure here and the blood pressure? Blood pressure is not... So the diagnosis is... Rectal contractions. Rectal contractions. Good. Okay. That's right. And here you can see 
where you have a, an increase in pressure in the rectum, you see a fall in detrusor pressure. Um, same, 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 same. Here, this is just a little, when you see very fast change like that, that's because something gets knocked. If you go next time you do urodynamics, just flick the, one of the tubes, you'll see these very fast changes. So good technique is absolutely important. And we would say that your urodynamics should be free of technical failure. Okay? Or put another way, it should be technically reproducible. So is your urodynamics biologically reproducible? Not really. Not really? Uh, not every time can be the same with the same patient. Yeah, okay. Can you think of another physiological measurement that would be sort of, would make your case? Like uh, overactive bladder, 50% of the time there's no overactive. Coming outside of urology. I didn't get the question, sir. So can you, you, you're telling me that it will, that it will, that your repeated urodynamics will not be identical, that's what you're saying? Yes, yes. So I'm asking you whether you can think of another physiological measurement outside urology that would make your case. Pulse rate? Yeah, absolutely. Pulse rate, blood pressure. If I take your blood pressure, if I take your blood pressure when you got up this morning, now, and the evening, they're not going to be identical. Pulse rate's not but I wouldn't expect you to have been hypertensive this morning, have a low blood pressure now, and then be normal tensive. So broadly speaking, you would expect a pattern, which is reliable. But of course, that's not necessarily the case. So patients with detrusor overactivity and overactive bladder don't have it every day to the same degree. They have good days and they have bad days. So if you hit a good day, you might not see any detrusor overactivity, no urgency during the urodynamics. On a mad, bad day, it might be doing this. So you must expect biological variability, but your technique should be good enough that there is no technical variability. And that's all you can do. It's got to be safe for the patient, as Professor Schneider said. You've got to be able to recognize artifacts. And if you don't start off with good quality, you can't recognize artifacts. So again, we come back to quality. And you should follow the recommendations because then we can all talk to each other. If you use different words and different techniques, then of course we don't know what you're doing. Good. We almost always fill the patient through the urethra. The only exception is if the patient already has a suprapubic for some reason or other, or if it's a child. Sometimes suprapubics are put on in under general anesthetic, and then the test is done later that day or the next day. But almost always we're doing it urethrally, and we use water or saline, depending on whether we're doing a video urodynamics, or, sorry, or contrast, if we're doing video urodynamics. Now, speed of filling we've talked about already. They used to be defined as three speeds, and some people still use these. And we would always use continuous filling. Again, the only exception is if for some reason or other you've only got one catheter in the bladder, then you have to, and that's usually because it's a kid or some, usually because it's a kid, you can only get one catheter in, then you fill, stop, measure the pressure, fill, stop, measure the pressure. That's not so satisfactory, but occasionally it's essential. So we talked about how fast you fill. So 1,440 minutes in 24 hours, uh, if you have a urine production of 1,440, then clearly the rate of production is 1 ml. So the rate of production is, as somebody said, usually uh, 1 to 2. If you drink 3 litres of beer in 60 minutes, you can, in theory, get up to 20 ml per minute. If any of you are interested in experimenting with that, then go ahead and put your data in. So most of our day, we spend filling. The vast majority, we estimated, three minutes a day voiding and 1,437 uh, filling your bladder. So as Professor Sinner said earlier on, we try to make the environment as nice for the patient as possible so that they're nervous. If they're nervous, this might affect their bladder function. As much privacy as possible. Men maybe are a bit easier because men are used to voiding in public. Women, as far as I know, don't void in public and hence they're probably 
more anxious if there are people around <coughs> talking or whatever. Uh, women seated, men standing, because, um, as we said, it's easier to keep people in the same position. If you start moving the patient around for no particular reason, then you will start to introduce artifacts because you've done that. The catheter might move, or you forget to change the position of the transducer, etc. But of course, if the patient's disabled, then sometimes you do survive. There's one circumstance where we lie patients down on purpose. Occasionally, you'll be um, investigating somebody and they have a very, very overactive bladder, a lot of detrusor overactivity, and you just can't get anything in. As soon as you put 50 in, they then have urgency incontinence and empty the bladder. Often, if you lie them down, then you can get more into the bladder. You've made the diagnosis of detrusor overactivity. That's not the issue. What you're now trying to do, say, in a man, is get enough into the bladder that you can get a proper voiding study so that you can make the diagnosis of prostatic obstruction, for example. So in terms of catheter size, then size is very important and conceptually you use the smallest possible catheter you can. Eight French is okay for filling and for pressure measurement it should be less than six. And I think Professor Sinner was saying that he uses a five catheter and that's fine. The length of the tubing should be the same to minimize the artifact of, of one wave arriving at the transducer before the other one. Now in terms of the catheters, um, as, as we'll describe later on, we do urethral pressure profiles. This is a standard filling catheter. We use an epidural catheter, so we don't use 2-5 French. We use an 8 French uh, for filling and we use an epidural and of course that is incredibly small and there's no way that could produce any obstruction and then we use a rectal tube uh, and if you want to use an epidural then in men it's, it's a technique to get it in and you have to engage the epidural in the eye hole of the catheter so that's just something you get used to when you're doing it uh, and then you railroad the catheter in Attaching the catheters is really important, as you know, because you're fed up if the catheter comes out halfway through the test. The patient's fed up because they have to be recatheterized. So the way you stick the tubes on is really important. <coughs> you can, if you want, use a two-way catheter, but we've already said there are some problems with that. You can get more artifacts uh, with, a, with a catheter that fills and measures pressure at the same time and you need then a different method of uh, attaching it. This is the rectal catheter that we used to use. We're no longer allowed to use it because it's alleged to be unsafe, which is nonsense. Nevertheless, we use a, you use the word balloon, and I said, well, it's not really a balloon. Why did I say it's not really a balloon? Whose turn is it yours? What did I mean by that? Do you want to speak into the microphone? So, so why have we put something on it? Why is this on the end of the rectal catheter? Why have we put this on the end of the rectal catheter? Uh, to give a... First of all, a patient is more comfortable also with something poking him and something more softer. Secondly, it has a fluid which uh, somewhat transmits the pressure. It's a water channel. After all, we need a water channel. To why don't we put a, Why don't we put one over the bladder catheter then? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Don't bother with that question. Why do we put one on the rectal catheter? Because there should not be air into the rectal channel. Contents are always in the rectum. Hmm? Contents may block. Feces may block the. It may be blocked by feces. Yes, it will be blocked by feces. So that's why routinely you put a you put a, a balloon in inverted commas. It's not a balloon. Why? It's not a closed system. What do we do? We make a hole in it. Right. We make a hole in it. Why do we make a hole in it? So, that, so that it's not a closed system. And it what what, what the, might happen if we didn't make a hole? Yes, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. Go on. It just measure the pressure within that balloon. Yeah. 
we're not here. We're not here to measure the pressure in a balloon on the end of a catheter. We're here to measure the pressure in the rectum. So you're, you're going to flush the catheters. So when you flush the bladder catheter, it goes straight in the bladder. Fine. When you flush the rectal catheter, if you don't make a hole in it, you create a pressure in a balloon. So that will make your rectal pressure measurement inaccurate. So uh, you're quite right. Okay, just now the key to... Just uh, making a hole is sufficient or you have to cut the part of the... Excuse me? You just make a hole in the... Just make a scissors. Scissors. Yeah. Nick it, yeah. So then excess fluid can escape in these way. So this is the key to the catheter's not falling out. You take, you take the catheter as, as close to the point it comes out because the weight of the tube, if you've got a loop of tube, then the weight will pull the catheter out. So just to go across this, over this again, the reference pressure is atmospheric pressure. The reference height is the superior edge of the synthesis boot. So you need both those. Okay. Then you need to calibrate your equipment. The pressure transducers we calibrate to zero and one hundred, and you want to get rid of bubbles and leaks, as you saw in the film, because they stop you making accurate measurements. We've been through this before. Top one good, middle one good, even though, uh, okay, well, we, we've done that one. Now, in terms of calibration, the first thing you have to do is to flush through. So here we've got our syringe. <coughs> the three-way tap is open. We're flushing through the transducer, out through the three-way tap, and out through the catheter. So we've made sure there are no leaks at the point of connections here or here and we've got rid of all the bubbles. Then once we've done that, we put the end of the catheter at the zero mark on a one meter ruler, make sure the machine measures zero, and then lift the end of the catheter to the 100 centimeter mark, make sure it measures 100. How often do you do that? How often should you do that? The calibration. Calibration should be done uh, before uh, starting the day, like every patient. No, not patient. Before the starting, the first case. Starting. First case. If you are doing three or four cases, one. In a day. Once a day. Yeah. Okay. Well, theoretically, it ought to be done every patient, but nobody does. Some people we found some people don't don't check it for three months. In 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 a study we did which is crazy, because if it went wrong after a week, then for 11 weeks you're measuring the wrong pressures. So, very regularly. Let's leave it like that. But certainly once a day. Um, and of course that, that applies uh, to everything. So, zeroing transducers, positioning transducers, calibration, quality of signal, which we've said is coughs, and then labeling your trace very important you label your traces so use the marker right on the trace because if you're like me after three year of dynamics you can't remember what happened to which patient so write down what the sensations change in patient position change in the filling rate that you sometimes do so when you start filling but the patient is still lying down at this point um, the bladder and rectal pressure should be similar and then if you move the patient you can see that the pressures change so when the patient is lying there at their lowest for the same patient they will move and increase I never quite understood why they're slightly higher on standing than sitting but they are we do 200 measurements 200 patients and then, of course, because the rectal pressure and the bladder pressure are similar, when you subtract rectal pressure from bladder pressure to give you detrusive pressure, then your detrusive pressure is in a very narrow range. So somebody pointed out detrusive pressure is zero. That's fine. You're allowed detrusive pressure between minus five and plus five. And roughly half people have one slightly lower than 
zero, and half have one slightly higher than zero. And the reason, of course, that is when you're, once you're sitting up is that the bladder and the rectum are on the same horizontal level. If you decided, well, I'm going to do something different, I'm going to measure abdominal pressure in the stomach. Can you pass that to the gentleman behind you? So if I decided to measure the abdominal pressure in the stomach instead of the rectum, would the pressure be higher or lower? Well, actually, we have to qualify that, don't we? It depends where the transducer is. So if you were daft enough to do it in the stomach, maybe you would have to remove the transducer. But actually, the pressures are lower because there's less sitting on the stomach. So the way I explain the changes in pressure from lying to vertical is that when you're lying down, there's not much on, on sitting on your bladder or your rectum, but as soon as you stand up, you've got the weight of all the guts sitting on it. So that's a simplistic way of explaining it. So what decides, what decides in an individual person whether they're, when they're standing, what decides whether they have a pressure of 20 or a pressure of 50? Remembering this is at the beginning when the bladder's empty. What decides? Where the dip of the catheter is. No, it doesn't matter where the catheter is. As long as it's in the bladder and in the rectum, it makes no difference. In a water-filled system, it makes no difference. Whether the, the, the catheter is at the top of the bladder or the bottom. The level of the transfusion. No, we're assuming you've done all that. Anyone know? How full the bladder Sorry? How full the bladder No, I've said the bladder's empty. It's at the beginning. How high of the patient? No? Uh, well, it might, it might have been the height of the patient. It could have been. Yeah. Being the body mass index. The BMI of the patient. Fat, fat patients tend to be at this end, and thin patients tend to be at this end. I think if you were very tall and very fat, like some of the linebackers in the NFL, they probably have incredibly high uh, intra-abdominal pressures. But of course, this explains why we ask women with stress incontinence to lose weight. Because if they lose weight, their resting bladder pressure will go back towards the lower level, and then they'll have better, uh, greater difference between bladder pressure and urethral pressure. So if the detrusor pressure is negative, it does not matter, because there isn't such a thing as detrusor pressure anyway. It's an artificial, it's an artificial pressure. So what you have to do before you start filling is to make sure the pressures are within those ranges. And if they're not within the ranges, you have to work out why they're not. The other thing we said earlier, when I showed you the trace of the ones that were set zero to the patient, you, we saw we had where the rectal pressure was declined. So I don't think either the bladder pressure or the rectal pressure should decline during bladder filling. If you have a problem, don't go on and think, oh, it will sort itself out. Because it might do, but probably it won't. <coughs> and you'll end up doing a useless test and wasting everybody's time. Now, in terms of quality, traditionally, we've asked, every, we've asked the regular cost. Now, I've suggested that, that maybe actually getting the patient to strain is better, but cost is high. Um, and if the subtraction is not accurate, then you need to recheck. So what we're looking for, as we've said, is that the height of the spikes should be the same, and therefore they subtract out properly in the detrusor pressure. Check at the back. So tell us what you think about this bit of uh, tracing. So the volume. You see this here, the patient's quite full. I think, what does that say, 537? Yeah, that's the 600 ml, so the, it's quite a big bladder, 537. What can you see on this? Quality first. Yeah, it is zeroed properly, and the cuff impulses are getting reflected quite nicely in both of Quality good? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah, lots of stuff going on here. 
all subtracted out, cough there, subtracted out. Yeah. I'm just seeing one detrusor contraction near the end of the study. So you're seeing a detrusor contraction here? Yeah. All right. So there is a little bit of something going on there as well, but that's subtracted out. So I agree. This is a high quality trace, and you've got a detrusor contraction of about 15 centimeters of water. So uh, that's useful. Is the patient symptomatic? Well, they've, they've signaled detrusor. They haven't signaled urgency, so we don't really know. So we don't want to see this. We don't want one spike to be 110 centimeters of water high and one to be 70, giving us a big positive spike. Now this tells you what you should do. So what's been done? Next gentleman. What's been done here? Is the quality good? No. Zeroing is fine. Uh, but the, when the abdominal pressure rises, there is uh, not an equivalent increase in the vesicle pressure. Okay. So there's no change in pressure here. What are these? Uh, this may be shifting of the patient or the uh, contract. What are those? Cough. Cough. Coughs. Okay. So the cough but is registered. Or two coughs or maybe even three coughs have registered on the rectal pressure but not registered on the lateral pressure. Yes. What has been done then? What is happening next? Describe what you see. There is a rise in the detrusive pressure. Huge rise in detrusive pressure. Right. Any change in the rectal pressure? So what's the explanation for that huge rise in detrusive pressure? So when you see an abnormality on detrusive pressure, where are you going to look next? Vesicle pressure. Okay, what's happened to the vesicle pressure? Equilibrium. Huge rise on the vesicle pressure. Goes right up there, and you can see it's right up there. So what's the explanation? You know? There's a sudden increase in um, so they've decided that the problem is here, that for some reason or other, the coughs are not being registered on the bladder pressure line, so they have flushed the bladder pressure line, and that obviously also gives you a big rise in pressure in the detrusor. Has that worked? Yes. It sort of worked, hasn't it? The cough spike is not as high still on the bladder as on the rectal line. So I would have liked to have seen a bit longer of the trace. Uh, and this is just to show uh, what, what, what we just thought. Okay, next person. Tell us what you think about this one. Again, we're still talking about filling cystometry. Zero is fine. Uh, on cough testing, uh, it's not exactly uh, subtracting out. There are still some positive. Um, Okay, so you've got slightly higher spikes on the bladder compared with the rectum, which give you slightly spikes, small spikes in the detrusor. And we say that if they're within 70% of each other, that's okay. Now, we said that. It doesn't really have any <coughs> scientific merit. But clearly, 100% is perfection, which you never get perfection. So we had to say something. So for some reason or other, we decided 70%. So that's less than 70%. And there are two detrusor contractions. With the first contraction, there is leak. What sort of contraction? Detrusor the overactivity. There, is, okay. there are two detrusor contractions and patients okay, leaking so on two big, during both. Two big waves here, and you're saying those are detrusor contractions. There's very little change on rectal pressure. And when you compare, you can see the contractions on the bladder pressure. So I agree. And then you say there's a leak? Leak. And what's that due to? Due to the detrusor overactivity. Patients having a detrusor contraction and he's leaking uh, with it. But the patient's just been coughing. Is it not stress incontinence? So who votes for stress incontinence again? Coughing. 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 I said, now I'm asking the questions. Who votes for stress incontinence? Who votes for detrusor overactivity in continents. Very good. I'm impressed. Okay. So you're quite right. If it had been stress incontinence, it would have occurred at the time of the coffee. 
And so, as you say, this is cough-induced detrusor overactivity, so it occurs a little bit later. And you can see here, there's a small leak with the second contraction. So what about artifacts? Well, at baseline, somebody mentioned if things are wrong, it might be the catheter's in the wrong place. And that, of course, is true. So if you see unequal cough spikes, then your first thing you're going to do is look at the catheter and make sure they're both in the right place. There could be bubbles or leaks, so you're going to flush both the lines, just to make sure that that's OK. During filling, then the problem might be that you have inadequate subtraction. You might be filling too fast. I don't think you can fill too slow, other than making everybody very bored. But um, uh, I don't think you could fill too slow. And then, of course, the major in filling would be movement of the catheter. And here's the thing about, you understood why uh, the, you get the delay in pressure transmission. So when the pressure wave comes along, so here you can see uh, there's a bubble from there to there. So when the pressure wave comes along, what it does first is it has to compress the air before it passes on the pressure wave. So that accounts for the delay and the reduction in pressure. So who's next? Where are we? Are you next? Okay. The uh, rectal birth catheter has been flushed. Well, it starts at the beginning. Why would Zero. they be flushing the catheter? Zero properly, but uh, there is progressive fall in pressure in the uh, rectal. Okay, so the blue for bladder is okay, but the rectal pressure, as you say, is falling. Okay. So they've decided they think there's a problem with the rectal pressure, so they flush the rectal line. What's this? So you can see that on the detrusor line as well, but not on the bladder not on the line. Bladder. What's that due to? Catheter has been repositioned. Sorry? Catheter? The rectal catheter has been repositioned. Um, yeah, OK. Yeah, it could be. So, so something's hitting the rectal catheter, yeah. but not the bladder catheter. And of course, anything that happens to that will be reflected here. Uh, and what do you think about the end? The Seem, outcome? Seems to have worked because there is a positive uh, uh, wave recorded on both abdominal and rectal uh, transducers on coughing, and it's yeah. more or less cancelling out. Yeah, good. Okay, so that so flushing the line seems to have corrected the problem. So when we now have done a technically good urinary trace, we need to interpret it. And as I said this morning, we're interested in bladder sensation. The primary abnormality of the detrusor is obviously detrusor overactivity. We're talking here about filling systometry. It's detrusor overactivity. We're interested in bladder compliance. We're interested in how the urethra is working, and we would like to know what the bladder capacity is. So bladder sensation, I think, is pretty straightforward. Uh, and I mentioned uh, what, we, what we see. Um, but in terms of you describing it, there are no specific metrics like centimeters of water, for example. So we're satisfied with saying it's normal, increased, reduced, or absent. So that's a bit, a bit uh, simplistic, but it's practical. We can all do that. We all know whether the patient's reacting normally, whether they've obviously got discomfort, they're jumping around when you put the catheter in, whether they hardly feel it. So if the patient doesn't react, I always ask the patient, can you feel the catheter going in? And they say, yeah, but it, it doesn't worry me. So I would say that's probably less than usual. Uh, and then some patients don't feel it at all, which is abnormal. And then in terms of descriptive terms, first desire to void, normal desire to void, and strong desire to void. And the abnormal sensations are urgency. So you're all young. If I feel your bladders, well, no, front row's young. Um, so you, I wouldn't expect you ever to get urgency. So if you came to the pub on this business we're going to do about three litres in one hour, 
you probably wouldn't get urgency. If I didn't let you go to the bathroom, you'd go into pain because your bladder was filling so far. So urgency is very different. It means you're going to leak. Now, if you've got a lot of pain, you might decide, I'll leak. Actually, it's not leak. You might decide, I'll void. And that's something that bladder pain patients do. So bladder pain patients sometimes prefer to leak a bit because they only need to leak the void a bit. They're not leaking, they're voiding. They deliberately void because they know they only have to avoid a bit, like 10 mLs, to get a significant reduction in their bladder pain. But that's not urgency. Urgency is very specific, it's not under your control. So urgency is abnormal, and of course bladder pain is abnormal. And as I said, first desire to avoid is about 50% capacity, normal about 75% capacity, and strong desire to avoid is when you're at what you consider your capacity. Of course, if I put you to sleep, I could get more in than that. So the hypersensitive bladder that I mentioned earlier, where there's no detritus overactivity, but the capacity is limited to 250 by discomfort. They have an early first desire to avoid. And what's interesting on their bladder diary is that they will often show very frequent voiding of small amounts during the day, but they sleep okay. So the first void of the morning is normal, three or four hundred mLs. So you know that there's no pathology in that situation. This is a sensory abnormality. There's no pathology going on. Um, but it, this is a definition which is a bit bristle. It's not really, it's, we think it's a useful definition, but it's not universally accepted. So that's what we mean by the hypersensitive bladder. Small capacity, less than 250, no pressure change. Detrusor activity, well, we've talked about that. Normal is relaxation, and overactivity may be spontaneous or provoked. Um, the overactive detrusor then is characterized by these involuntary detrusor contractions, either spontaneous or provoked. And in general, they tend to increase in magnitude as the bladder fills. Although the first trace that I showed you like that, it didn't particularly, they tended to say, they were staying roughly the same, but in general, they get bigger as the bladder continues to fill. <coughs> that's the one I showed you, so there you'd say, actually, they're a bit bigger at the beginning than the end. So that's a little bit unusual. Though. The provocations you can use are change of posture, getting the patient to sort of jump up and down, cough, strain, filling fast, or ice water. Now, the change in posture is an interesting one because we, we, we talked about the cough, cough-induced detrusor overactivity. But in elderly patients, particularly elderly women, they will tell you that they leak um, at night on the way to the bathroom. And it sounds a bit like stress incontinence, but if you go into their history carefully, they will tell you that they wake up because they know they need to go, but they're not desperate. They lie there and think, well, I can't get back to sleep until I go and empty my bladder. As soon as they change position, they get urgency and clearly get a detrusor contraction and they can't get to the bathroom. And so that's detrusor overactivity and incontinence. It's probably worse in women because, of course, their pelvic floors are not as good. So hanging on by tightening the pelvic floor is much more difficult for women after childbirth than it is for men who have a, a more integral uh, pelvic floor. So uh, we looked at this trace, didn't we, just now? So cough induced detrusor overactivity. Now, how small can an involuntary detrusor contraction be? Well, the answer is it can be very small, and it depends on the quality of your urodynamics as to whether you can really say this is an involuntary contraction. So if you've got very high quality urodynamics, you can say very small waves are detrusor overactivity. Originally, it was defined as a wave of 15 centimeters or more, but then we saw patients who had smaller waves, who had urgency. So we realized that that wasn't appropriate. So it's, if it's a smaller wave, it's significant, but only, as far as we know, if it causes you symptoms. So particularly in elderly patients, you will see small waves, and if the patient doesn't say anything, you say, well, can you feel anything at the moment? And they might say, well, 
maybe I feel as if I'm just beginning to need to go. But they don't say urgency. They don't give an indication they've got to dash to the bathroom. So you have to tie up, and that's why, um, as Professor Sinner said, it's so important that neurodynamics is a two-way communication, where you're asking the patient what they feel. Is this like, are you like this at home, is, or is this different from what you like at home? And if they say they have a small way and they say, I really need to go now, then that's significant. On the basis of? Uh, cough from the okay. initial part. Yeah. And um, you know, some straining or talking going on here. All of this is properly subtracted out. Good. Contraction in the middle of the study, which is marked very small. Uh, contraction. A contraction here? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, let's have a look at that then. So there's certainly a rise in pressure there. Let's go up to the bladder. <coughs> is there a rise in pressure there? No. Not very convincing, is it? So why has that pressure gone up? We've said it's good quality. Here's another cough which is perfectly subtracted out. Well, if the pressure in the detrusor goes up and the bladder pressure hasn't changed, it must be because the small leak. Uh, it must be because don't change abdomen. the subject. <laughs> abdomen has gone down. Pressure abdominal pressure has gone down. Yes. Correct. So has the abdominal pressure gone down here? Yes. Well, yes, it has. But even more, com it's more confusing, isn't it? Because it looks like there's a small leak. So why is the patient leaking? And I can't answer that. Leak here. Why is the patient leaking here? Why is there a leakage here? It happened during cough. Yeah, the patient's just cough. Now that's a little bit after the cough. Anyone knows why know why that is? There's no detrusive activity here, is there? So well because if you leak slowly it takes some time for the urine to get from the urethra into the flow meter. If you, if you leak fast or you pass urine, it takes no time. But you imagine it's got to dribble down the side of the funnel and then get in. So that takes one, two, three seconds maybe. So that's the explanation why there's a bit of a delay. So I don't know that we've got the answer about this patient. Good. Anyway, these are interesting traces to speculate on. And only having half the information is helpful, isn't it? <laughs> now, one of the things we need to remember is that we, we talked about flow and, um, well, we haven't talked that much about flow, but we'll talk about flow being dependent on the relationship with detrusive contractility and urethra resistance. But also, pressure, the measurement of pressure is also the relationship between contractility and urethral resistance. So in this diagram, this is a woman who's got involuntary detrusive contraction, so here's detrusive pressure, and there are waves of contraction, and she's leaking at a pressure of about 20, and she has a weak urethra. So if you repeat her urodynamics, filling through a Foley catheter with a balloon occluding the bladder neck, you will find that the same contractions give a higher pressure. So when the bladder contracts, it can do two things. It can create increased pressure, and it can create flow rate. Or it can create both. So in voiding, usually when your bladder contracts, you get an increase in pressure, and you get a flow rate. But if you have an involuntary contraction, so if any of you have involuntary contractions in the next 10 minutes, I hope that you won't be leaking, so your detrusor will only produce pressure, it won't produce flow. So in this situation, in this situation, this contraction can produce pressure and it's producing leakage. In this situation, because you block the bladder neck, the only thing it can do is to produce increased pressure. 
So we mustn't forget that, particularly when we look at female patients with stress incontinence, it may appear that the detrusor overactivity is relatively minor. But if the urethra is not very good, then the, ur the urine comes out at low pressure. And when you do a good operation for stress incontinence, they might turn into the second version and have great trouble, or greater trouble, they think, with detrusor overactivity incontinence. Now, what about bladder compliance? This is, of course, what we mean by bladder compliance, that here's our, our pressure scale, here's our volume, and here is the increasing pressure. The area under the curve is, of course, if you're mathematically inclined, the volume in the bladder. So compliance is, describes the change in volume per unit change in pressure. So from the bladder's point of view, that's ml per centimeter of water. So you look at the capacity, and then you divide it by the change in pressure from empty to that point. So you get compliance is equal to the change in volume per centimeter of water. And in terms of causes of compliance, well, this is a very old slide. And a lot of these things we rarely see. So loss of viscoelasticity, where the actual structure of the detrusor muscle is changed by a disease process, is relatively unusual these days. So we used to see it uh, from things like radiation, when radiation was, was much cruder. Um, pelvic radiation would cause big changes in the bladder. You see it with tuberculous cystitis, you say. Interstitial cystitis, and by that I mean proper interstitial cystitis. In other words, Hunter's ulceration, where there's been a lot of scarring, a lot of fibrosis, then you may see poor compliance. But not what is often called interstitial cystitis, which we'll no doubt debate on Sunday, which probably should be called bladder pain syndrome. Then there's a small group of patients with high pressure chronic retention, and patients who've had a catheter left in for a long time, probably because they have urinary infections repeatedly, and so their bladder gets fibrotic. And then there's a, a, a variety of neurological diseases, spina bifida, spinal cord, radical pelvic surgery, and myelopathies. So this is what we mean by this. So um, one more gentleman at the back, tell us what you think about this. Colors are a little bit different here. We've got a lovely mauve color for detrusive pressure, but still rectum red, bladder blue. Quality? Quality. Good, bad, or, in, or medium? Uh, good, bad, or good quality. Sorry? What did you say the quality was? Good. good. Yeah, I agree. Quality, good. Big coughs here, equally subtracted, yeah. What's this artifact here? So it's on, the, it's on the bladder pressure line. It's not on the rectal pressure line. And it, of course, it's on the detrusor line, which it would be if it's on the bladder line. Something what is it? Something is touching the... What? The fast filling phase with the... Filling tube is touching to the... Good. Pressure. So if you use a peristaltic pump to fill the bladder, you know, roll the pump, then you get pulses. And you, if you watch the line during urodynamics, the line actually does that. Well, you shouldn't have it touching another catheter, but here you can see it's been touching uh, the, where are we? It's touching the bladder catheter. So you get this artifact just due to the one tube hitting the other like this. Okay, now, what are, we, what are you going to tell us about the urodynamic findings? Anybody? Poor compliance, yeah, so poor compliance defined as the pressure, well the pressure here is what, that's um, uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, so the pressure is about 10, and the pressure goes from about 10 to a pressure of about 30, so that's that norm, pressure increase of 20, and there's no reason to suspect that uh, quality is an issue, again there's straining here which is well subtracted out, good. 
Anybody think this deters your overactivity? I don't particularly. I can't convince. I can't convince myself of this. No. This is a. Um, I think this is a spina bifida patient. Um, just to orientate yourself. Uh, don't worry about the figures here. They're nonsense. Uh, the bladder volume is 423. The bladder red for rectum. Can you give me something down here? So tell us what you think about this. Quality? Good quality. Good quality, yeah. Spikes are normal. Pretty well subtracted out. Leakage of the urine is happening. What you say? The flow. The flow, there's a leakage of urine. Leakage of urine, yeah, okay. Leak, 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 lots of leaks, yeah. What's that due to? High pressure in the bladder. And how would you describe the pattern here? Erratic. Hmm? High pressure bladder. Overactive bladder, you would say. High pressure bladder. High pressure bladder is not really a term we use, is it? <laughs> we say to choose your overactivity or, or poor compliance. Which do you think it is? We will go for the dose of You think it's to choose your overactivity? Okay. So, um, can you see any waves here? bladder pressure, <coughs> gradual increase in pressure from, so that's 0 to 100, so there's an increase in bladder pressure from about 35 up to about, I think I said 78, without any waves. So that's not really like to choose your overactivity, that's what, that's like poor compliance, isn't it? That's what we would describe as poor compliance. And then have a look here, this is bladder filling. So at this point, they've stopped filling the bladder because the line becomes flat. So that means they've stopped filling there, they've stopped filling there. What happens to the pressure at that point? What happens to the bladder pressure at the point that filling has been stopped? There's a stabilization of the pressure in the bladder. Stabilization is stabilization means it stays the same. Yeah, it stays the same. Does it? So yeah. we stopped here. Ladder pressure is here. That doesn't look so stable to me. So the pressure falls. Okay. When you stop the filling, the pressure falls. Here again, you've stopped the filling at this point. The pressure falls. What does that tell you about your technique? What does it tell you about your technique? We are over filling it at a very fast pace. Yeah, we're filling too fast. So if this was, if you were filling, if this filling rate was okay, it would do what you say, stabilize. Meaning it would neither go up nor go down. So at this point, the detrusive pressure would stay up here. But it doesn't, it falls, which means you're filling too quickly. So that's an important point. If you see this change in pressure, well, they should have never got to that stage. They should have been stopping low, uh, at an earlier rate and slowing the filling right down so that you weren't seeing this. Because if you think about it here, so we're going from zero volume up to 423. If this was really the pressure of the bladder in real life, what would happen to your kidneys? They wouldn't, they wouldn't work. No urine would get from the kidney into the bladder. So this is an artifact. 
This doesn't happen in real life. And in fact, Newcastle, a group in Newcastle showed that if you take bladder patients like this and then fill them naturally from their own kidneys, one or two ml per minute, you have a completely different trace. Now the trace you get is not normal. They still have poor compliance, but not to this degree. So in a way, there's a sort of paradox here that this, although it's an artifact of the test, is actually really useful because that shows you that this is a dangerous bladder. Even though the pressures aren't accurate, it's a pattern, it's a dangerous pattern. And that gets us to the discussion about what's a dangerous pressure, and those of you that have taken an interest in this will know about Maguire's work from the 70s, where he said leak point pressure, so leak point pressure here, you see, detrusor leak point pressure is actually whatever that is, 100 or something. Okay? So he said that if it's more than 40, then that's dangerous for the kidneys. Now the problem was that he didn't define how he did the tests. They were in children, small children, mainly spinal bifida, amino myosin children, and he didn't define how, how, how quickly he filled the bladder or anything. But it's something which has stayed on in the books. We don't know whether 40 is important or is 30 important or 25. Bearing in mind that detrusor pressure should basically stay flat throughout bladder filling. So anything above a compliance probably of 40, which would mean going from 0 to 400 with 10 centimeters of water change, anything above that should be taken very seriously and the patient should have more regular ultrasounds to look at upper tracts and possibly have regular urinalics. So. Don't worry about that being a technically questionable investigation. It still shows that it's a dangerous bladder. So the compliance is often artifactual due to fast filling or poor technique. So I have a colleague in London who does fast filling, one of the people who does filling at 100, and they describe poor compliance in neurologically normal women. We never see that. And that is entirely due to the fact that they decided they want to fill at 100 ml a minute. No relevance to the patient. So um, that's an artifact due to fast filling, what I would say was poor techniques. And most of the patients that we see who have poor compliance are neurological patients. But there is this interesting group of elderly men with prostatic obstruction with true prosthetic obstruction who have this idiosyncratic filling. And of course, they're the patients, you see, who come in as an emergency. Nobody's ever seen them before, but they come in in renal failure because they've got high pressure bladders and they've already got renal damage. You put a catheter in and they produce 15 liters of urine in the first 24 hours or whatever. You've seen these patients. They're rare, they're a very small subset, and nobody understands quite why they behave in this way and the majority of men don't. So you don't find poor compliance in neurologically normal women or unobstructed men. Urethral function. Normal function is that the urethra is competent, abnormal is incompetent. Very occasionally you will see a patient who leaks inappropriately. In other words, they're sitting there during urodynamics and suddenly they leak. You look at the pressure chasings, there's no detrusive contraction, and they're not straining. Okay? They're leaking, no pressure changes. So the only way you can leak without pressure changes is your urethra has relaxed. It's rare. Don't worry about it. Urodynamic stress incontinence is leakage during raised intraabdominal pressure in the absence of a detrusive contraction. And one of the issues we, we talked about was how do you get a woman to leak, who won't leak, but she has a history, and the other way is ask her to abduct her legs. That seems to weaken the pelvic floor and make it easier for you to show um, stress incontinence. I showed you this trace earlier on, and here you can see Valsalva is causing no leakage, but these are, perhaps not surprisingly, these are much higher pressures, you see, so that's 0 to 100. So these are pressures almost 140 centimetres of water, much higher than the Valsalva, which is here is 60, and here is 80. 
So uh, that's classic stress incontinence. Bladder capacity, what's normal bladder capacity? How long is a piece of string? So anywhere you can make up the figures for yourself, if you like. 300 to 700, what's low capacity? Maybe less than 300. What's high capacity? Maybe more than 700. These are arbitrary numbers. So what about modifying technique? In a neurogenic patient, if they're not catheterizing, it's recommended that you don't empty the bladder. You get the patient to come in to pass as much as they can, you then put the catheter in, and then you fill them from that volume. And of course, at the end of the test, you empty the bladder and measure how much is left, so you know no residual urine. But most of our patients, at least, by the time they come for urodynamics, are on intermittent catheterization. So we would normal, normally get the patient to empty their bladder by intermittent catheterization, and we would fill them uh, from zero. But if you see a reduction in compliance, then stop the filling and wait. See what happens. If the, if the pressure falls, then you are filling too fast. So restart the filling at a slower rate. So our indications for filling systometry are pretty much only when patients are going to have surgery of some sort. In the neurological patients, such as the poor compliance, then they're done as um, surveillance to make sure that their bladders are not deteriorating in a dangerous way. So <coughs> diagnosing detrusor overactivity and stress incontinence prior to here botulinum toxin or sacral nerve stimulation and here stress incontinence surgery. Other patients with storage symptoms without incontinence who are saying my quality of life is terrible, I need something doing. You need to find out what's wrong with them. And then, as I said, neurogenic patients to look at dangerous bladders. So, in conclusion then, attention to detail and quality control is absolutely vital because it's a waste of time interpreting a trace when you've got poor quality. You need to modify the techniques, as we've said, move the patient around perhaps to stimulate stress incontinence or slow the filling rate down in poor compliance. And the most common abnormalities we're interested in, of course, are detrusor overactivity and urodynamic stress incontinence. Thank you very much. So regarding the definition of compliance, it should be, should it be a change in pressure with regard to change in volume or should it be a change in volume regarding change in pressure? No, compliance is always change in volume per unit of pressure. So, so it's for how example, much? 10 ml per centimeter of water or 40 ml per centimeter of water. No, no, what he wants to know is whether it should be pressure should be in the numerator or the denominator. You can't change it. <laughs> you know, there are some things which are worth discussing and some things which are not worth discussing. So you'll have to produce a very good argument to convince the world to change the way in which you measure the plants. What's your very good argument? I mean, if you change the volume, the pressure changes in a certain way. So if you think that the bladder volume is changing, and so the corresponding change in pressure is there. Which means there's change in pressure with regard to change in volume. But the definition says it's change in volume with change in pressure. You are completely saying in reverse. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Well, there is, yeah, there is, there is a, a physicist, a physicist could make, might be able to make that argument. But it's, uh, it's, it's so well ingrained the measurement of change in volume per unit of change in pressure, that there doesn't seem much point in changing to me. Sorry. <laughs> but you might be theoretical, you might be, if I was a theoretical physicist, I might say, he's got it right, you know, we've been doing it wrong all these years. But I'm not a theoretical physicist, so we're not going to change it. <laughs> okay. The worst point of safety, 40 million centimeters. The safety is hmm? bladder pressure. Yeah. Uh, to treat pressure. Yeah, the yeah. yeah. So, is it uh, from the uh, 
do we have to consider the baseline pressure or the feeling pressure and then feeling pressure? Sorry, baseline pressure and feeling pressure. Which pressure? What's the first one? And feeling pressure. And feeling pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it that well known that has to be considered, or do we have to? Well, I think. I mean, I think McGuire was right in saying that the pressure that's significant is the pressure when the patient first starts to leave. Yeah, yeah. That, that might not be the end of it. Not just that, but it might be that pressure. Should it be from the feeling, from, from the baseline, the pressure upwards? Okay. So the, que so the question is, what's the, what's the, so your question really is, what's the baseline? Yeah. Well, the baseline, of course, is going to be between minus 5 and plus 5. So it's not going to make much difference. And I think this, as I've said, this is very imprecise because the actual technique we should use, if we wanted to say, well, the, the actual pressure that's dangerous, we haven't defined the technique. And I'm pretty sure it would vary in different groups of patients. So I think the fact that you've got poor compliance is the danger signal. And it means then that you are mandated to follow this patient more carefully than a patient who has a pressure that's completely flat. Anybody who has a pressure that's going up, you should be following them very carefully. If you start from minus five, then you report it five. Oh, well, okay, well, that's why. Yeah. Yeah, if the pressure is negative to start with, then yeah, in theory it should be the difference from the start pressure. But the pressures, as I say, are pretty much around zero. So you're talking about one, two, three, four, maximum five centimeters of water, which probably isn't, is probably outside the limits of accuracy of your measurement. So it probably doesn't matter. Can you use the pressure? We're going to talk about your equal pressure at the end. Okay. Save your question. We, we're okay for time, Aaron, because um, in the sense that the next talk is quicker. So, theoretic in which we judge when to stop filling. What information do we have that allow us, allows us to judge when we stop? We should stop filling. Yeah, but some patients don't have much. Some patients don't have much sensation of feeling. So what information have you already collected? From the bladder diary. From the bladder diary. Very important. Yeah, so you can use the bladder diary as a sign as to how full you should fill the patient. And remember, if you overfill a patient, they will not void normally. So.